I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend His cause. Maintain the honors of His word, the glory of His cross. Hello, I'm James Brown, and on behalf of the Eastern Church of Christ located in Toronto, Canada, I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday Sermon edition of Walking Through the Bible, a podcast where we seek to study the Bible and the Bible alone. Please stick around afterwards for information on how you can contact us. But for now, we'll turn it over to Jeremy Dieselkamp for our Sermon of the Day. This day and age of iPhones, iPads, Androids, and all of these other technological devices that seemingly control our everyday lives, the idea of renewal has become somewhat old-fashioned. I remember back when I was in school, and that I know I sound old when I say that when I was back in school, we would have a library period once every two weeks, and we would go to the library and we would actually sign out a book that we were to read. We usually would get it for two weeks. If we were younger or older, we might get it for a little less. And the next time we went to the library, if we wanted to take out that same book again without having to uh, return it, we would have to renew the book. Same thing went for movies. The last 15 years has seen a vast change in the way we watch movies. There was no Netflix or any of the other streaming services like it. So if you wanted to see our newly released movie without having to go and buy it, you would have to go to the video store, rent the movie, and you'd usually get it for a couple days. And if you wanted to watch the movie longer, well, you'd need to renew it. Today, however, technology has largely done away with this idea of renewal. Now if I want a movie and I have a Netflix subscription or something very similar to it, I can watch a movie on demand whenever I want without ever having to worry about returning it later. Now, that's not to say that renewing has become completely extinct. Those who have mortgages know that every four to five years you must renew the terms of your mortgage with the bank. That involves you sitting down with the bank and renegotiating the interest rate that will be charged on your mortgage and the type of mortgage that you're actually going to take out, whether it's a fixed mortgage or a variable mortgage. But this idea of renewal has become less and less common as society has moved forward. So with that being the case, it is necessary for us from time to time to remind ourselves what renewal means, for scriptures speak of it. In Titus chapter 3, in verse 5 we read, He saved us not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration in renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now, in this chapter in Titus, Paul is telling those in Crete how they were saved. They were not saved because they themselves were great people or somehow were deserving of being saved. They weren't saved because they performed man-made acts of righteousness that earned their salvation. They were saved because God was merciful in that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for the remission of sins. And that when they obeyed God, they were regenerated and renewed by the Holy Spirit. Now we'll touch on what that obedience looks like a little later. But for now I'd like to focus on this word, renewal. The word renewal itself has many different definitions. According to dictionary.com, it can mean to begin again. It can mean to make new or make as new again. Hence the word renew. It carries the prefix re, meaning again. Making renew to make new again. Renewal also carries the meaning of being restored to a former state or to make effective again for an additional period of time. We, do, we talk about that when we talk about leases. These definitions are similar to the Greek word used in Titus chapter 3 verse 5. So applying these definitions to that verse, we find that when we obey God, we, meaning our spirit, 
is taken from the bondage of sin and restored to the former state of sinlessness that we had when we were a child, that is, before we sinned and became guilty before God. Being, in renew being renewed involves being forgiven by God of our sins. But the area that we are going to examine this morning is not really going to be the how are we renewed, but what is involved in God renewing us in the first place. To do this, we're going to go back to the Old Testament. If you read the first slide, you'll know where we're going. We're going to examine two kings of Israel. One was going to have his spirit renewed, while the other was not going to have his spirit renewed. Now, if you would turn in your Bibles, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. It's going to be our first verse, set of verses this morning. It's a longer reading, so uh, you can get out your Bibles and follow along. 1 Samuel chapter 15, we're going to read starting at verse 1. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent, him, sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now, now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote destruction to all that they have. Do not spare it, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telium, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah, as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. He had, uh, and he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and devoted to destruction to all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatted calves, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. It was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed on and went unto Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears, and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep, and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took up the spoil, sheep and oxen, and the best of the things devoted to destruction, uh, uh, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to, li and to listen to the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as the iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned to go away. Saul seized the skirt of the robe and it tore. 
And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me, that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. And Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. I know this is a very long reading. The reason we read it, and the reason we're going to read the entire next story as well, is so that we understand not only how these two men sinned, but also so we will find out why one man was forgiven by God while the other one was not. And of course, this first story is the story of Saul and King Saul. Here, Saul was told to utterly destroy the Amalekites. The reason God gave was not because God was somehow vindictive. No, it was because what the Amalekites did when Israel came out of Egypt 400 years earlier. You read that in Exodus 17, but for time's sake, we're going to read verse 14 of that chapter. Exodus 17, verse 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So moving ahead 400 years, it was finally time for God to fulfill his words. He was going to have Saul utterly destroy the Amalekites. And what Paul, or what, sorry, what God meant when he said utterly destroy was not left to Saul's imagination. He was to kill all of the men, all of the women, all of the children, as well as all of the animals. There was to be nothing left. They weren't to take anything alive. Yet that's exactly what the people did. Sheep and oxen were spared for sacrifice unto the Lord. King Agag of Amalek was spared as well. Now when Saul, Samuel approached Saul about this, Saul had the audacity to claim that he had obeyed the voice of the Lord, when in fact he only partly obeyed, to which Samuel replied he had rebelled against the Lord. That should tell us something about partly obeying. It should tell us that that's still rebellion. God demands complete obedience. Saul was to be representing God's wishes. And instead of honoring God before the people, he disobeyed God and dishonored him among the people. For his rebellion, God rejected Saul from being king. Now, finally, near the end of the story, Saul admitted that he had sinned and asked for forgiveness. But we do not read anywhere in the text that God forgave Saul for this sin. Now, we're going to contrast that to the next king, which is King David. Turn now to the next book of Samuel, 2 Samuel, chapter 11. We're going to read all of chapter 11. We're actually going to get into verse, chapter 12, going down all the way to verse 15. 2 Samuel, chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. In the spring of that year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sat and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, how the war was going. And David said to, said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? 
Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and, the, and Israel and Judah dwell in booths. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in an open field. Shall I go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Remain here today also. Tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk. <clears throat> and in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him that he may be, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. Some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about fighting. And he instructed the messenger, When you have finished telling all the news about the fighting of the king, then if the king's anger rises and he says to you, why did you go near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerubacheth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall, so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near to the wall? Then you will say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, the men gained an advantage over us, and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messengers, Thus shall you say to Joab, Do not let this matter trouble you, for your sword devours uh, now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. For the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew with him and his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he has done this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall not depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he will lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You will not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went up to his house. Now, of course, this is the story of David and Bathsheba. We know the contents of this story very well. There are many lessons taught from this story. But what I'd like us to consider, and I would like you to have noticed, the difference between David's reaction to when Nathan told David he was in sin 
to Saul's reaction when Samuel told Saul he was in sin. For David, even though his sin was different to that of Saul's, it was still said to be despising to the Lord, in that he committed adultery with Bathsheba <coughs> and then killed Uriah, her husband, in order to cover it up. Now, like Saul, David admitted his sin. Yet in 2 Samuel, Nathan comforts David by telling him that God had forgiven him. Samuel never told that to Saul, at least that we have recorded. So we ask the question, why was David's spirit renewed? In other words, why was he forgiven? But Saul wasn't. The first thing we're going to look at is at David and Saul's initial reaction when they were confronted with sin. If you go back to 1 Samuel 15, uh, in verses 13 to 21, you'll find that Saul needed to be convinced that he was in sin to begin with. Let's reread again 1 Samuel 15, beginning verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul and said, Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop, I will tell you what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribe of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. The Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight, fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission that the Lord has sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Now when Samuel arrived, Saul proclaimed that he had obeyed God, yet Samuel's response then, Why then do I hear sheep? Now this should have set off alarm bells in Saul's head, that something was not right. He had come and said, I have obeyed the Lord God, and Samuel didn't come and say, Yes, you have. No, he said, Well, why do I hear sheep? Instead of admitting his sin, though, Saul tried to justify it. He said that the people did it for the purpose of sacrificing to the Lord. Samuel told him that to obey was better than sacrifice. In other words, if we sacrifice to God and don't obey Him, God won't accept our sacrifice. And that was true of Saul as well. It was only after being totally convinced that he had sinned that Saul admitted that he had sinned, despite the clear evidence that Samuel had given him, and the clear commandments that Saul knew he broke. Now let's look at David's reaction. Nathan told David a parable about a man who had plenty of sheep, yet robbed the poor man of his only sheep. David was rightly angry at this man, and he even said that this man deserved to die. Nathan turned to David and said, You're the man. Now, David could have argued with me. He could have said, no, I have done no such thing. But he didn't. He acknowledged his sin right then and there. Now, both of these initial reactions aren't by themselves the reason that David was forgiven while Saul was not. But it certainly showed the condition of their heart and led both men to what they did next. The second thing we're going to look at is David and Saul's recognition of who their sin was against. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 8, we find that Saul admitted that he had sinned against the commandments of the Lord and the words of Samuel. On its face, that sounds correct, and it is. But listen to David's words in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. I have sinned against the Lord. He puts it this way in Psalms 51, verses 3 and 4. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. So in comparing these two men, 
you really have to wonder if Saul really understood the gravity of his own sin. He had not only sinned against the commandments of the Lord, he had sinned against the Lord. Each and every time we sin, we sin against the Lord. That's why we're deserving of God's wrath. It's not because we sinned against other people. If we do, we're deserving of their wrath. When we sin, we sin against God and deserve to be punished by Him. David understood that. I'm not certain it's basalt. When we fail to grasp the gravity of sin, we minimize its importance and try to deflect its consequences. Not recognizing sin for what it was is what led Saul to where he went, while David, recognizing his sin, led David to where he went. Third thing we're going to look at is David and Saul's acceptance of who was to blame. Going back to 1 Samuel 15, 24, we find that even as Saul was saying that he had sinned, he was providing excuses, seemingly assigning part of the blame to the people. In 1 Samuel 15, 24, we read, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed against the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Yes, Saul was admitting that he had sinned, but instead of stopping there and taking full responsibility, he gave an excuse as to why he sinned. Fear of the people. It didn't matter why he disobeyed the Lord, whether it was because other people told him to, or just because he wanted to. The fact of the matter is, he sinned. He knew what the word of the Lord was. Samuel was very clear at the beginning of the chapter, and yet he chose to disobey it. The sins of the people would be on them. He was not going to be responsible for their sins. He was going to be responsible for his sin. There was no excuse that Saul had as to why he sinned. Contrast this with David. He didn't say, if only I had gone to war like I should have. And we can make that point, we do. David shouldn't have been there. He should have been at war. If only he hadn't done that. He says, I wouldn't have sinned if I didn't do that. He could have said, if only I had not gone out on the roof, I wouldn't have sinned. We, we sometimes will talk about having too much spare time can get us into trouble. And it seems like David had too much spare time. But he didn't provide that excuse either. He didn't come along and say, if only Bathsheba wouldn't have been bathing within my sight, I wouldn't have sinned. And we sometimes, when we talk about that, talk about modesty and talking about how we should not tempt other people. And those are good and right lessons to talk about. But David didn't provide that excuse either. He didn't say any of those things. He simply said, I have sinned against the Lord. He didn't try to rationalize it, justify it or provide excuses for it. He simply admitted that he was to blame. Acceptance of full responsibility is what will ultimately lead to our next point, which is talking about how each man sorrowed for their sin. When we read 1 Samuel 15, did any one of you come away with the idea that Saul really sorrowed over his sin? Sure, he basically said, I'm sorry. But even after he said those things, Saul was still concerned about himself and how he would be viewed among the people. In 1 Samuel 15, 30, we read, Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the, for the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I, may be, that I may bow before the Lord your God. What a strange thing to say after you've sinned. Oh, I have sinned, but honor me now. That doesn't sound like a man who was sorry that he sinned? Sounds like a man who was sorry he got caught. Saul's pride got in the way, but instead of feeling genuinely sorry for sin and repenting, he was only concerned about his personal standing before the people. That wasn't David's attitude at all. David showed genuine sorrow over his sin, as is evident if you read the 51st Psalm, which is David's response to this sin. He fasted and he prayed seven days for the child so that perhaps God would change his mind and spare the child's life. He wasn't concerned with his own standing before the people. He was concerned with his standing before God. And because he was concerned with his standing before God, it will bring us to our final point this morning, which is examining these two men's pleas for forgiveness. 
You remember in 1 Samuel 15, 25, Saul asked for forgiveness. But the attitude that we found in Saul already would show us that Saul really didn't repent of his sin. He merely asked to be forgiven without change. Now, how do I know this? Because the scriptures teach us in 1 John 1, verse 9, that if we are children of God, if we confess our sins, God is just and he is able to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Righteousness. Note, the verse doesn't say God may forgive us of our sins. Or God can forgive us of our sins. But that he will forgive us of our sins. This is a guarantee with which we can have confidence in. But in order for God to forgive us, he requires us to repent of our sins. Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 3, if we do not repent, we will perish. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Saul didn't have a godly grief for his sin. He had a worldly grief. Saul's grief didn't produce a change in Saul, a return to the Lord. It instead caused him to walk further away from God. Now, David's grief, on the other hand, caused him to repent to return to God. Listen to David's words in Psalms 51. Psalms 51, we're going to read verses 7 through 12. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Let's try that again. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than, whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your, of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. The first thing that David asks is to be purged with hyssop. Hyssop is an herb that is known for its antiseptic properties. He wanted his soul cleansed, made as white as snow. He wanted God to hide his face from David's sins, not from David himself. He wanted God to blot out his sins and remember them no more. David wanted God, not himself, to create in him a clean heart and to renew his spirit. And David didn't want to be cast away from the presence of God and from the Holy Spirit, but to have the joy of his salvation be restored to him. David's repentance was borne out in the fact that he accepted God's punishment. The child that was conceived in adultery died. David did not complain. Absalom overthrew him, causing David to have to flee. David did not complain. No, David acted righteously and continued in righteousness for the rest of the days of his life. Did he ever sin again? Yes, he sinned again. But the man after God's own heart always sought to walk righteously. And when he didn't, he repented and he asked God to forgive him. His faith and trust in God never wavered until the day he died. That's the reason that David's spirit was renewed, that he was forgiven, and Saul wasn't. David's faith caused him to repent, to ask God for forgiveness, and he returned to God. Saul's lack of faith caused him to continue in rebellion, to turn away from God, and remain in sin. So it is with us. The Holy Spirit has promised to renew us to God if we will but obey Him. If we are not a Christian, obedience means believing in the Son and His Son Jesus Christ as our Savior, the one who died on the cross for our sins, who was raised the third day, who is now ascended into heaven as King of kings and Lord of lords. It means repenting of our sins, changing our heart towards sins, not just being sorry for our sins, but actively changing our life and our attitude towards sins, determining to walk in righteousness from here on out instead of walking in sin. It means confessing Jesus Christ as the Son of God before people. 
And it means being regenerated in the waters of baptism by having our sins remitted so that we can be raised to walk in newness of life. If you're not a Christian, this is the only way to be renewed. For there is no other way to the Father except through Jesus and His revealed Word. But if we are a Christian and have sinned since then, and let's not deceive ourselves, we have sinned since then. We're reminded here this morning that sin does not separate, sorry, let's try that again. We're reminded here this morning that sin does separate even the follower of God from God himself. 1 John 1 verses 5 to 7 says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. As Christians, we are in need of renewal by the Holy Spirit when we sin. But that requires faith. It requires repentance. And it requires us to pray to God for forgiveness like David did. Only spiritually renewed people will be in heaven. And the question is, have you been spiritually renewed? Thank you, Jeremy. And for our viewers, we also thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button below. Should you have any questions or comments, please leave a comment below or email us at answerintheword at gmail.com. We'll try to respond to you as quickly as we can. We hope you'll also view today's question and answer edition, which can be found on our YouTube channel on the Walking Through the Bible 2018 question and answer edition playlist. Please also join us, Lord willing, tomorrow when we will be continuing our study of the book of Genesis. Goodbye for now and have a great day. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend His cause. Maintain the honors of His word.